this is covering the spread. Here are your hosts, Jim Sawness and Dr. Ed Feng. What is going on, everybody? Welcome on into Covering the Spread. That is right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network. You can find Covering the Spread wherever you get your podcasts. It is a sports betting podcast, taking a look at what the odds say over at FanDuel Sportsbook. My name is Jim Sonnes. I am a senior writer and analyst for NumberFire.com, joined here, as always, by Ed Fang of the PowerRank.com. Ed, pretty exciting because we are now... I think it's 12 days away from the first kind of biggish college football games of the year. Oh, I, We're talking college football already uh, today. It's, How you doing? It's I'm great. I mean, it's not kind of biggish. It's big. It's Miami, Florida. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think like a ton of expectations on Florida uh, to see if they can really continue what they did last year, which was a little bit of a miracle, uh, a little bit of a miracle worker by Dan Mullen there. And then Miami just named their quarterback today. And it was yeah. not any of the guys that, that people expected. <laughs> So, I mean, I, I, that's, a, that's a big Week Zero game. I'm really looking forward to watching every play of that. Yeah, or or uh, maybe, maybe not the second half of Florida runs away with it. But, but My uh, college big. roommate is a big Ohio State fan. So when they announced it was not Tate Martell starting, just immediate laughing was, was the, the first message that I got. Uh, you know, I mean, it's an interesting, interesting development there down there in Miami. I heard the guy can't really throw the ball. Like all last year, we talk about Tate Martell as the backup and goal line situation and kind of like, you know, running the ball in. But, you know, I mean, he was never going to take the job from Dwayne Haskins. And, you know, he transferred immediately when when Fields came to Ohio State. If he were a good thrower, they would have used him as like, a you know, like they would have utilized that when he was in on those packages. There was a reason he was in in specific running scenarios. Right. So I don't think it's that big of a surprise. Uh, but, yeah, right. I think that that's a pretty fair assessment for sure. So uh, that game is on the 24th. That's not that far away. You can bet on that over at FanDuel Sportsbook. And if you want to get in on the action, check out the FanDuel Sportsbook and place your first bet today. If you lose, FanDuel will give you a refund of up to $500 in site credit. Visit sportsbook.fanduel.com for more details. Terms and conditions apply. Must be 21-plus and physically present in New Jersey or Pennsylvania gambling problem call 1-800-GAMBLER and speaking of college football we're talking to Bud Elliott most of you probably know him from SB Nation and also now of the Banner Society you can follow Bud on Twitter at Bud Elliott 3 covers college football and recruiting for SB Nation and the Banner Society he's also one of the rotating hosts on podcast ain't played nobody uh, one of the podcasts listen to a lot uh, actually both the SB Nation college football ones, that end, uh, the shutdown full cast, two irregulars in my rotation when it comes to college football podcasts. We're going to talk with Bud about college football championship and playoff odds, things he looks for early in the season when he's trying to find edges, when it comes to betting totals and stuff like that. So uh, really you know, impactful stuff here from Bud. We'll talk to him in just one second. But first, Ed... I got to eat some crow because last week we talked PGA, which means we have a cover in the past to discuss. It didn't really go so well for me. Things happen. Covering the past. All right. So last week here on covering the spread, we talked about, or I talked, I will not tie this to you, Ed. I talked about Matt Kuchar and how I liked him at 40 to one at FanDuel Sportsbook to win the Northern Trust. And that number didn't move before Thursday tea times, which is kind of the first red flag. Uh, And Kuchar was bad. He did gain 2.2 strokes in approach and he gained 1.2 strokes around the green. That's good. But he also lost 2.9 off the tee and lost four strokes putting in just two rounds. And it was only two rounds because dude missed a cut. And it was a 122 golfer field. Tiger withdrew. So it was actually even a bit smaller than that. So not a good showing for Matt Kuchar. I don't think it was awful given that, uh, you know, his off the tee play had been not that bad before then. And he's uh, generally a plus putter and putting is pretty volatile. So seeing that those were the areas where he lost strokes Made me feel a little bit better, but, you know, the results were not great, Bob. Uh, But regardless, we'll keep on cracking here uh, later on. Ed, uh, are you a golf guy at all? I know we've only talked golf once here on the podcast, but any golf interest for you? Yeah, I mean, a little bit. What's the randomness in terms of, like, putting versus approach? So, putting is... You said I talked a little bit about there was randomness in in the putting. It's a smaller sample, and so I think that, like, 
from a predictive nature. Like, let's say Emiliano Grillo gains strokes putting and gains strokes in approach within one week. You, I would have more confidence saying he will gain strokes in approach the next week than I would saying he would gain strokes putting. There are different putting surfaces, and you can look at putting surface splits over at FantasyNational.com. But I think that, you know, in general, one thing to do when you're playing, you know, when you're trying to bet golf is look for guys who are due for regression, whether it be they've been a bad putter recently but are not historically a bad putter, or guys who have been putting their minds out but may not be good as putters. You can use putting putting numbers as a good way to look for regression. That's kind of what I did with Kuchar because he had lost strokes mm-hmm. putting uh, in the previous two events and finished 40th because of that, but his approach numbers have still been good. He'd been good off the tee, so I thought he was due for regression. And uh, it, that didn't quite happen. But in general, putting numbers are just far less sticky than other ones. Okay. So for me, Good it's all know. about approach, essentially. And yeah. uh, Matt Kuchar had that. Didn't have anything else going for him, though, at the Northern Trust. So we'll chalk that one up in the loss column for covering the pass. But that's enough of that. Let's get to Bud Elliott once again of SB Nation. Find him on Twitter at Bud Elliott 3 and talk a little bit of college football. You're uncovering the spread. Covering the present. Let's bring Bud Elliott into covering the spread here to talk some college football. Bud, I want to welcome you to the show. You got a lot of stuff going over at SB Nation with the Banner Society launching. So busy time of year for you. How are you doing today? I'm, I'm doing well. Really busy time. I'm just completing my research on on most of the teams, and I, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a new dad, so I'm about two weeks behind where I wanted to be on that, but uh, you know, really wouldn't have it any other way, and. Uh, Banner side has been going great. We're, we're focusing on creating content for people and not algorithms and, and, and making sure that when they leave us, they have a positive association uh, w- w- with the site and with whatever brands having to advertise on the site. So we think it'll be a little more in-depth coverage, uh, things that, that we would want to read. And that, that's right. kind of the guiding principle is that let's create content that we would want to consume and, and let's be open to what platform we need to put that on, whether it's an article, podcast, you know, video, mm-hmm. Twitch stream, Twitter chat, Reddit, wh- wherever it happens to be, uh, let's let's go ahead and, and use the right tool for the job. And Bud, as someone who's consumed a lot of SB Nation content over the last couple of years, and myself, I'm excited about this. Uh, what about for you specifically within the Banner Society for the fall? I, ne- I think you mentioned on one of your podcasts, you'd be doing a live picks thing on Sunday morning. Uh, you know, what's the plan for you specifically with Banner Society? Sure. So uh, a lot of the lines do come out uh, on on Sunday, and my thought was, okay, what what is the majority of our audience actually wager? Okay, as far as dollar amount, I, I doubt very many of them are, are, are more than the nickel players, right? Um, maybe a couple, but if you are, you probably don't need to necessarily watch a a, a gambling related podcast or, or TV show. <laughs> you you probably have your own modeling, and. Uh, so I'm like, let's let's go ahead and, and set the tone for the week. There, there are not a lot of um, gambling shows out there who will, will go ahead and go on Sunday. And that, that's what I'm ready to fire. So why not give the people my perspective when these openers come out? Uh, and then later in the week, we'll, we'll do a follow-up segment, discuss moves and, and things that maybe I still like uh, in the podcast Ain't Played Nobody uh, podcast with, with Stephen Godfrey. So sort of setting the table on, on Sunday. It's going to be on Twitch and, uh, and taking people's questions and then recapping a bit and, and projecting more towards the weekend on Thursday. And Bo, what, I mean, you, you were writing a column last week about picks on, on Sunday, again, with the same type of audience in mind. What was your record there last year? I think I was 57%. Now, it's, it's against yeah. openers, but look, right. most people, I think, can use that if they're willing to put their stuff in on Sunday. Yep, absolutely. Uh, but I wanted to ask you a little bit about your process, uh, just thinking about games. Uh, we're starting to head into the season. How do you think about totals in games? Do you have a process for that? I do. So I, I use a couple of different power ratings, and, and I also consider uh, tempo a, as a big factor. I actually did a Twitch show on this recently, right? How do we attack totals early in the season? I, I think there's potentially some some angles there that, that we can we can look at and attack, particularly with coaching changes. If we know that a team wants to go faster or slower, uh, certainly the, the bookmakers most likely know that some, but the public might not fully know that. So it might, there may be some value there in the spread. So I, I'd look at certain teams. For instance, Utah State last year operated it at a really fast tempo, especially considering their run-pass ratio. 
they now have a, a new head coach, a, a defensive coach in Gary Anderson. Now he has pledged to keep that same tempo. Um, that's something you can look at. Okay, it, do you think he really will? Not sure. You, you may want to take a position there. Other teams certainly are going to play much faster or or much slower. Northern Illinois last year, I believe, was a top 15 or 20. I don't have the numbers right in front of me. Top 15 or 20 tempo team. Now that their new new coach, Thomas Hammock, is coming in, he's from the NFL, which traditionally operates, I mean, obviously at a much slower tempo. And he has a coaching background at Wisconsin, which is not a tempo team uh, either. So I would project Northern Illinois' tempo uh, to decrease based on that relative to what they were. I think in the first month, there's there's some opportunity uh, to, do, to do some of those. And there's like 20... No, sorry. I think there's like 40 coaching changes last year that, that I was looking at that I, I, I kind of looked at them from, hey, you know, for sure, for sure, increase, for sure, decrease, probable increase, probable decrease, and then unsure or, or, or neutral. If you can pick out five or six, that can give you an advantage in that play. And that's one of the advantages of just paying attention, honestly. And that's kind of a huge thing that you've talked about, you know, as far as betting early season numbers is trying to, you know, know where the advantages may be. And for you specifically, Bud, you know a lot about recruiting and that seems to be your edge. And a big part of betting is kind of knowing where you have an edge over the crowd, over the public, and may be able to use your knowledge to your advantage. So with recruiting specifically, how can you leverage that knowledge when it comes to betting on college football? So oftentimes, I, as far as media, I'm one of the last people to have seen uh, the, these players who were either high school players last year or who were backups, right, and, and have not played a whole lot of college football. Um, I know generally how talented they are. A lot of people can see that, though, by looking at the recruiting rankings. A lot of the recruiting services do a pretty good job, especially overall, uh, on, on rating a player. But what they might not tell you is, okay, is that guy rated highly because of his ceiling or because of his floor? And knowing that, being around these kids, seeing how they act maturity level sometimes as well on, on the margins, right, can tell you, okay, this guy may be a player who's able to step in and play and contribute early, whereas somebody else may, you might know, okay, he's a high four-star player. However, that's a, a, a long-term projection because his top end is so good but his floor is lower. So if you're able to, to know that as well, you can kind of figure out or not totally figure out. I don't want to claim I, I have all the answers here on that, but you can get a general idea of who might be, be more ready to step in uh, and thus which team may have a, a smaller drop off than you would initially project based on who they lost off last year's team. Interesting. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, are you kind of, I mean, you're almost looking to see if any of these guys are Antonio Brown type drama Queens that, you know, could, came in with a lot of hype and just could not be that good. Right. Or just, you know, not really evolve to the stresses of the college game. Exactly. Right. And, and there's plenty of kids who were immature in high school. Uh, I mean, probably some of us uh, <laughs> who, who turned out to be, be fine folks. And it's not that, that they can't be ready. It's not, that they can't become productive players. It, it's just the, the readiness factor. Are, are they, are they guys who, are they sort of like professional college football players or are they going to be longer term uh, guys? And you hear that from, from coaches and, and assistants and other people you talk to. Yeah. I, I like this kid long term, but they, they have to de recruit him. They have, they have to get him right. He may need a year or two in the weight room type thing. Whereas a guy who, all right, he, he should be ready to play right away because he's experienced because he's, he's already pretty developed. He may not be a super high ceiling player. So knowing that I think can be helpful. Absolutely. And just kind of, you know, having context behind the numbers is always a very helpful thing. Now, Bud, we brought you on here to talk uh, some college football national championship numbers. And I think that it makes sense to start from a broad perspective because we've got this four team playoff and there is an extra degree of variance because it could lead to a dominant team, whether it be due to injury or something like that, losing in the semifinals. But we've still seen either Clemson or Alabama emerge as a national champs in four straight seasons, all with the playoff. So when you look at this as a better, does the presence of a four-team playoff make you more willing, less willing to bet championship odds, or does it not change anything for you when you're looking at, you know, championship odds as of right now? Sure. So I, there's a couple things I do look at here. Uh, with the playoff, I feel like it is less likely that a team – I'll plug my blue chip ratio article here that, that, that yeah. I do every year. I, I feel like there, it is less likely 
that a team without really elite talent wins the title now than it was under the old BCS system. And the reason is that the odds say that in order to do so, you, the, the Cinderella or just the team without maybe the hyper elite recruiting are going to have to defeat not only one, but two uh, of, of those teams. We, we saw with Marcus Mariota and Oregon, a team that had recruited well, but not on that upper echelon. Uh, they had a, a superstar quarterback, which I think is probably the formula if you're a non really elite recruiting team if you want to win a title you have to have a in my opinion a Mariota type QB they got to do one a, a team in Florida State and they, and they whipped right. them a, a team that, that had recruited very well they failed to beat Ohio State so I, I would say if if you're not a really elite recruiting team I'm not interested in taking a flyer on you in the new playoff format Right. And and that was a I mean, that was a Florida State team that underachieved, too. So in some sense, you could say that Oregon maybe got a break in that semifinal game. Uh, oh, for well. sure. Yeah. So uh, you talked about the blue chip. Uh, this is an article you do every year. Maybe run through a couple of top teams uh, that you expect are going to contend for the championship. Sure. So blue chip ratio real quick for those out, out, out there listening. Are you signing more four and five stars than two and three stars? I don't adjust for transfers. I do not adjust for um players who who flunk out of, of school it's just the signing class I, I just want a very baseline did you bring enough talent in over the last four years to it, it's a necessary but not sufficient condition for me uh it's right. not a, a satisfactory condition for everything else but that's sort of the baseline talent thing this year 16 teams i think ohio state bama georgia lsu florida state usc clemson penn state michigan texas oklahoma Notre Dame, Washington, Auburn, Florida, and Miami. And A&M is, is the one that's, that's real close, but they're they're not quite there. One more recruiting class, and, and they'll join, join the fray. So Penn State was one of the teams listed in there. Uh, and I guess, to me personally, that was a bit of a surprise. I did see you talking about them on Twitter. What are your thoughts on Penn State, given that they grade out so well in that blue chip ratio? Yeah, when when James Franklin took them over, their their blue chip ratio was in the teens, uh, and 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 now they're up there, uh, close to sixty percent, doing well. They're consistently bringing in better and better talent. Clearly, they have some continuity and some experience replacement concerns on offense, uh, and, and they've not really been, as far as the advanced metrics go, certainly not Ohio State's equal, and and also not Michigan's equal, uh, in in the power rankings. But their rec their record's been fairly well, or, you know, fairly good. James Franklin always did a pretty good job at Vanderbilt. I do have some concerns of their continued uh, issues replacing Joe Moorhead, but I'm, I'm willing to be patient and see see how that looks. I, I did notice there were some uh, plus 2,500 and plus 2,800 for Penn State to win the Big Ten, uh, and that just seemed a little bit inflated to me. That was, I don't know, maybe a month ago. Most places that I look now, it's more plus 1,800, plus 1,600, which feels – you know, a little more in line. Um, so I, I, I took a nibble at that. Oh, Absolutely. there you go. So at the FanDuel Sportsbook, um, you can either bet on the championship straight up or you can bet on individual teams that make the four-team playoff. Uh, do you have a preference on which market you like more? Honestly, it, it really depends on if I'm betting the team because I believe that they have the chance to win it all or if I'm betting the team because I, I think that they have a more favorable schedule. Schedule matters in both. I think schedule matters more when you're betting just to make the playoff. For sure. instance, I might back a team like Utah if if I got the right price to make it. I, I was looking at their schedule today, and I, I know people think Washington is a favorable schedule, but the the order in which Utah's schedule drops is is pretty favorable, right? So they, they do have to go at Washington, and, and Washington is off a bye when they go to Washington in early November. But But here are the four weeks preceding that game for Utah bye week at Oregon State, which is <laughs> probably <laughs> one of the worst pack, you know, power five teams out there, host Arizona State, host Cal. Hmm. Y Utah yeah. could go into that game relatively healthy and take a little bit of practice time in each of those weeks to rep some concepts for Washington. Uh, additionally, they they get a bye week but, you know, after, after Washington State, which could help them to heal up. Their finish is... Very cozy, right? UCLA at Arizona host Colorado. Hmm. Yeah, that's not bad. That's, yeah, that's interesting. I mean, I think the Washington schedule comes in a little bit more with the North. Uh, right. I mean, I found their schedule to be much easier than Oregon um, in terms of not getting Oregon at home 
And then I think Stanford and USC are two common opponents, but Oregon gets them both on the road and Washington gets them both at home. So I think right. that, you know, that schedule thing is, is really about who's going to win the North. And uh, yeah, I like what, what you're saying about Utah and the South and the, and a sleeper to make the playoff. Although, you know, the Pac-12 has been dry a couple of years there now. Right. And I would not bet on Utah to win it all. That, that, that was, right. that Utah, I don't think, has that super elite level talent to be able to win two back-to-back games at that level. But it, it wouldn't totally shock me if they, if they went 12-0. and 0. And that's where the blue chip ratio comes into play. So uh, certainly relevant there when it comes to Utah. Let's talk about a couple other specific teams here. Uh, right now, I mean, obviously, I think going into the year, we can assume that Clemson and Alabama are probably going to be pretty good. But for the past four years, they've kind of been in a tier of their own. So, Bud, as we enter 2019, do you view that as being the case once again, where Clemson and Alabama are kind of in one tier, and then it's everybody else beneath them? Yes, I, I think they belong on their own tier. I don't know that there's an enormous gap between them and three, four, five, six, whomever you have there. Uh, but I, I think they are a pretty clear, uh, pretty clear one, two in, in whichever order you'd like. I mean, Clemson has to replace a lot on the defensive front, but they have, hmm. first of all, their, their culture is tremendous. So I, I really am a believer in the way Clemson develops talent. Uh, they, their blue chip ratio is only 61 and Bama's is 80. Uh, right. And, and yet, which shows again, kind of gets back to the idea. It's, once you get to a certain rate, it's not really how many more four and five stars are you packing in. It's you have this minimum level of elite talent. How are you developing it after that point? I know for a fact that Clemson really likes a lot of these replacements that they have been coming in on the defensive line. Trevor Lawrence is is a stud, and we, and Bama is just so talented. Um, it, it's it's hard, I think, not to have those two, one two in some order. But from a talent perspective, recruiting wise. Georgia and Ohio State are really close. Mm-hmm. And I think Michigan, because of, because they have Shea Patterson, who, who I do like, and I think they'll open it up more, they could end up kind of then with Oklahoma being in, in, in that uh, in that 5-6 range, not that far behind necessarily. Although I'm a little concerned about Oklahoma after uh, their top or the most experienced right. DB got hurt yesterday. So Clemson yeah. is plus 170 at FanDuel Sportsbook, and Alabama is plus 230. And I think that... If you're viewing the gap between them and the field as not being that large, it might turn you off when those numbers are so short. So are you inclined to bet either Clemson or Alabama at their respective numbers, or are you kind of staying away and betting on longer shots for this year? I, I, I would prefer to bet on, on longer shots, which I, I honestly, I don't, I don't have any national title bets this year. Mm-hmm. Um, Interesting. There's, there's nothing that really jumped out at me. Part of that is, you know, I, I, I was away on, on the paternity stuff, uh, <laughs> which when, when I came back, I was happy to find the Penn State uh, availability there for, for the for the Big Ten. But there's nothing that's jumping out to me right now at at that level. I I do like LSU a lot, but the best I'm seeing out there is, I think, plus 2000. Um, and that, their mm-hmm. schedule is is still really tough. And I'm, I'm not that inclined uh, to go ahead and take that. There are 5,000 at FanDuel Sportsbook. Ooh, there you go. Just going to float that out there for Ooh. you if you're price shopping. <laughs> might might a whole have to take a little trip up to New Jersey. That's right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but I want to ask you about a couple other teams. I mean, Oklahoma, they lost their best defensive back. This was a unit that has horrendously struggled over the past two years under Lincoln Riley. Um, talk a little bit more about what you think of this team, offense, defense, otherwise. Sure. So I, I think they're going to be considerably better on defense just because of the renewed confidence and – and a better coaching. Uh, but Riley has said, look, we are not where we want to be in terms of defensive depth. And, and I do think the recruiting bears that out a little bit. They do not have the depth of elite athletes in the front seven uh, that, that some of your teams in the SEC or Clemson or Ohio State or Michigan might have. One area I'm also a little bit concerned about, is that they did lose a good bit on the offensive line. Um, right. Kyler Murray was incredible, and, and so was Baker Mayfield. And Jalen Hurts has great escape ability, so I, I do like his ability to run around. But there were times last year, go watch the UCLA game, where Kyler Murray had seven seconds to, to, I mean, in the pocket. And would just he's like, oh, well, it's been five full seconds. Let me, let me scamper around here for a couple more and then find somebody open. It, if they were in another league that produced better quality defensive linemen with regularity, I would be more concerned. The Big 12 does not produce a whole lot of great defensive linemen so it, it mitigates the concern a little bit, but it still is a 
a bit of a concern if you're betting them for the national title, mm-hmm. because they are going to have to face. What are the chances that they have to face uh, Bama or Clemson or both in the playoff to win the title? Decent. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So, but uh, Michigan struggled. Struggled recently uh, over the past couple of years to kind of get over the hump with Jim Harbaugh. Um, they're plus 280 to make the playoffs and minus 400 to miss. Um, do you see any value on either side of that one? If you gave me like plus 330, I I might take a bite on that. Um, I, okay. I do think they're going to open the offense up more with Shea Patterson. I have a lot of confidence in, in Don Brown to make that defense uh, be able to withstand some of the personnel losses they had. And they have really recruited well on defense. I think their offensive line also is going to be going to be improved, right? I, I, I like what Ed's doing up there. Uh, not not you, Ed. But, <laughs> Dude, obviously, I do to, like what you do. But I'm doing great things in Ann Arbor. I don't know where you, <laughs> you are. I, I want to see Ed go coach offensive line. But uh, Ed, Ed Warner, their, their offensive line coach, they made really good strides uh, last year. I, I think they could take another step forward this year. At the okay. same time, is it hard for y'all to get that Michigan game, Michigan Ohio State game, out of your head? Just, no, I've completely just forgotten how bad that was. Actually, and I and I did a. I'm doing an episode of my preview series on it, which everyone's going to hate me for, but <laughs> uh, it's Bill Connolly and and explosive plays and all that stuff. But but Bud, you're obviously right. Like that. I mean that that Ohio State game is obviously terrorizing everyone, and how can it not? Um, but. You know, I mean, I think when you look at the underlying metrics and you when you look at these types of metrics that Bill tells you to look at, you know, the success rate in that game was was pretty close. Uh, and I'll get into more on that a little bit later. Uh, but I do want to ask you, um, you know, there was a coordinator change with Josh Gaddis coming in. He's promised to go more up tempo. That's got to be something you look at when you're looking at totals, too, early in the season. It absolutely is. And obviously we had the controversy this week for those who saw it on Twitter, whether, uh, I think Loxley said that he was the primary play caller or something, and uh, <laughs> whatever. There's a difference between making suggestions and making decisions, but I I think Gaddis is really sharp. Uh, I, I know him more as, as a recruiter, and an ability to relate to young people is is really high, right? The, the, the kids at Bama loved him. I know for a fact rec- recruits love him, and not in that sort of like salesman, huckster type of way. There's an element of that with any good recruiter, but uh, I, I think he's a sharp guy. Look at his progression up the ladder. A lot of really good coaches seem to like Josh Gaddis. I think he should do well there. And yeah, if you're if you're evaluating Michigan, Michigan plays a defense that oftentimes gets the offense off the field very quickly, uh, yep. be, it, be it sack, turnover, or once in a while, a uh, long explosive score. They don't typically allow 10, 12 play drives. If Michigan's operating at a greater tempo, and the defense keeps that same um, characteristics, you could have, have some overs in Michigan games this year. Yeah. Yep. We're talking here with Bud Elliott of SB Nation and uh, the Banner Society. You can find him on Podcast Ain't Played Nobody, one of my favorite college football podcasts, which is continuing under the Banner Society as well. And Bud, let's talk here about some teams you're monitoring. And, you know, when you're price shopping out there, maybe you're looking into certain teams to see what their number may be at different books. You mentioned LSU is a team that is at least interesting to you, especially if their number is as long as it is at FanDuel Sportsbook. And the other teams stand out to you as ones you want to monitor when it comes to either their playoff odds or their national championship odds. One I've been monitoring just for, for humor purposes is Nebraska. Uh, I, I, <laughs> I think Nebraska is going to be successful under Scott Frost. Um, they're going to give him a long enough leash to where I think his build could resemble what Washington did under, under Chris Peterson to where elite recruits didn't flock to them immediately and eventually they started doing so because of the winning and that's a tough model to replicate right a lot of a lot of fans are like oh well when the wins come the better recruits will come uh not not always it's it's really important to knock that knock the ball out of the park in your first two full classes but i think because of the patience they had there with frost uh he may be able to to kind of follow that peterson model at washington when looking at, at their talent over time however uh the Nebraska love this year is is a little extreme. Um, I don't know that they're going to make that big of a leap uh, from from year one to year two. So I, I've been sort of monitoring them. Are they a top twenty team in in y'all's futures? Uh, they got to be. They're eighty to one. Um, so they're in the same tier as Auburn. Uh, they are <laughs> uh, Utah is seventy, 
Uh, Oregon yeah. and then Miami are both 60. So that's kind of the range they're in right now. They're actually they have the same odds as Wisconsin and shorter than Penn State. Yeah, yeah but <clears throat> I really like how you bring up the similarities with Washington, and I think the similarities go a little bit further. I mean, Jake Browning was a huge part of getting that program back to an elite level at the quarterback position over the last three years. And with Nebraska, you got Adrian Martinez, like a guy, a fr- guy who I thought was really good as a true freshman last year. So can he take the leap? Can he help Scott Frost, you know, get to that winning level? Obviously, there's a lot of reasons for doubt, particularly along the defensive line. Uh, but I, 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 like the, I like the analogy that you have between those two programs. Can you imagine, and for, for those who don't know, Martinez was actually committed to Tennessee for a long time. Can you imagine what Tennessee fans would be saying if they actually still had him? <laughs> that, that, it, it, it would totally <laughs> change their, their fortunes. I will All say I'm monitoring Auburn, by the way. Yeah, um, okay. Uh, talk to me about Auburn and LSU. Uh, you mentioned LSU before. So what draws you towards those two teams as far as monitoring what their prices may be for championship futures? With Auburn, it's the defensive line. I mean, their, their, their defensive line is, is so talented. I think they could be better on the offensive line as, as well this year. I, I do like them in that game against Oregon. But, of course, what's the question here? Quarterback. Are they going to go with Joey Gatewood, who is not a great thrower, uh, at least – from what I've seen personally as a recruit and then continued reading the practice, the practice reports at Auburn, are they going to go with true freshman Bo Nix, who I do feel as a quarterback recruit coming out is pretty advanced. Uh, however, he's still a true freshman playing in the sec West. That's not something that works out uh, too often. Although perhaps if, if Tua had done so, um, you know, prior, maybe we'd feel a little bit different about that. But with, with Auburn's talent on the defensive line, I, I think it's it's worth monitoring. It's just that division, plus yeah. Oregon added onto the schedule, uh, is is so brutal. And Auburn's cross divisional opponent on a yearly basis, being Georgia, uh, is, is is worth it at least half a loss, depending on, on, on how you project that w- w- when you're sort of adding up your win shares. LSU, I think their offensive line is going to be improved. They are talking about throwing the football more. Um, they, they get Clavin Chasen back, who's one of the more talented pass rushers in the SEC. I think they've added an immediate, like, SEC caliber starter, upper-level starter type caliber player in Derek Stingley, the corner, uh, who was the number one corner in the country. And a lot of people thought he was the best player overall in the nation last year coming out of high school. If you put him and, and Fulton out there, even if he's your number three corner, I don't think LSU secondary is going to have much of a drop-off. I, I know they lost Grady Williams and some guys to the NFL. So I really like their ability to get stops there on defense. But if you bet LSU, you have to answer yourself the question, can they score on Alabama? Cause if they can't, this is you, you, yeah. your bets probably done. Yep. And yeah, recently completely. they, and, and they can't. I mean, so many questions about Joe Burrow at quarterback still for me, um, couldn't run the ball last year, which is part of why you were mentioning improvement on the offensive line. Yeah. A lot of questions there. Absolutely. Uh, so, Bud, let's close up here uh, just by ignoring the odds for a second. I just want to get your prediction. You know, I want to hear what four teams you think will make the playoffs this year and which team wins it all. Again, you don't have to go like – you can just ignore the odds here. If Bud had to pick right now, who would you pick to be the four teams and the champion for 2019? All right, I'll take, uh, I'll take Clemson-Bama for sure. Okay. Um, and then for the other two – I, I think I'm going to take Georgia uh, okay. to make simply because they, they got left out last year. There's probably some backlash due to the amount uh, by which Oklahoma lost in that playoff game. The fourth is tough. I, I'm really torn between between Michigan and Ohio State because I don't really think Utah is going to go 12-0. They, they could, I guess. But I guess I will go... I guess I'll go Ohio State, but man, that, that game's on the road. So I, I guess I'll, I'll go Michigan. That that one is, is really kind of a toss for me. All right. Michigan plus 280 to make the uh, four-team playoff. But I, I do want to thank you once again. Follow Bud on Twitter, at Bud Elliott 3 Bud, thanks for sharing your knowledge here, talking a little bit of recruiting, talking college football. Excited to get week zero underway, not too long from right now. Uh, so uh, enjoy fatherhood. Uh, enjoy getting ready for the season. And hopefully we'll talk to you again soon. Absolutely, guys covering the future.
One final thank you to Bud Elliott of SB Nation for stopping by and talking a little college football, national championship odds, among a plethora of other topics. And uh, really good info there just in general about how to bet early in the season, things to look for, and uh, things that may be impactful when you're betting totals and stuff like that. And I think, Ed, honestly, like that's just such good knowledge to have of things, because there's a lot of things we need to pay attention to. But it's good to narrow that list down a bit and kind of find the impactful things to research when you're trying to cram stuff in before the start of the season. Yeah, absolutely. And Bud is great about his approach. Um, he actually didn't even talk about some of his approach to spreads, which is also interesting and a very good approach as well in terms of combining a, a number of different power rankings. But uh, yeah, Bud, Bud is in, in the kind of journalist community, Bud is um, kind of a betting savant in some ways. Yeah. And that shines through in the way he talks, too. So I uh, really appreciate that Bud swung by. Let's take a look at covering the future right now and look at some bets that our numbers like. And last week, Ed, we talked with Gil Alexander of VEASAN about the Oakland Raiders and why he's betting the under on them. And since then, there's been a lot of news around the Raiders. <laughs> so you're going to talk about the Raiders, a team that nobody has thought about within the past week. Uh, what do you see with them <laughs> as of right now? Well, I've been a little bit reluctant to talk about Oakland. Um, mm. I think they might be okay this year. Okay. And I think that might be a little bit of a controversial take. I've got these nightmares of Adam Kaplan calling me after the show and firing <laughs> me for my bad takes on Oakland. You're going to have and to sell me on this one. I'll, I'll tell you that. What's that? You're going to have to sell me on this one. Well, I mean, but let me let me give you all the reasons why okay. you might not think that they're going to be that good. And you can certainly question their management. So they traded away Khalil Mack for a couple first-round picks. They traded away Amari Cooper. And, and you can think, oh, we're building for the future. We're, we're developing all these assets and then they go out on free season, free agency, and they sign a bunch of guys like they want to win now. So what is it? Um, are you are you are you trying to plan for the future? Are you trying to win now? And then Gil brought up the point is like, well, can can Gruden coach? And you know maybe that's tough after such a layoff that that he was on. But I think there's a lot of underlying reasons that that they could be pretty good, and it all starts with last year's numbers. I started looking at success rate last year, uh, and this is a, kind of a sticky predictive statistic, uh, more so than yards per play, that I, I've been starting to get into. And a play is success if an offense gets half its yards on first down, 70% on second down, and all the necessary yards on third and fourth down. And I was always interested last year that the Raiders were like 10th when I look at adjusted success rate on, on passing plays. Um, they weren't very efficient, kind of throwing the ball down the field. Um, but there was a little bit of a story to it. Like, o Oakland couldn't really pass protect that well. And so they had Derek Carr, the quarterback, throwing short. Um, you can look at this in terms of uh, A-dot, or average depth of target. And he had the second lowest in the NFL last season. Uh, but he was pretty good at completing those passes. Uh, he had a completion percentage of almost 69%. And now he adds Antonio Brown as a deep threat. They perhaps get better at pass protection with uh, with Trent Brown. And so I, I see a unit that can potentially be top 10. Uh, on defense, they have a budding shutdown corner in Gary and Connolly. Uh, he was a second-year player last year. He was hurt as a rookie. Uh, but by football outsiders, the Raiders were second in the NFL against guarding top receivers. And, you know, I mean, that if he can, I mean, if he can turn into that type of shutdown corner, I mean, that's the type of player that, you know, teams that we're talking about in the Super Bowl, like Indianapolis and Kansas City, they just don't have. They helped uh, with the rest of the secondary. They drafted safety Jonathan Abram, which is a, is a first round pick that everyone seems to like, uh, a guy that can start right away. They signed LaMarcus Joyner as a free agent. Uh, they drafted uh, defensive end Cle Cle Cleveland Farrell as a pass rusher. So hopefully they can get a little bit better there. And then there's some young players uh, uh, that could be really good. Maurice Hurst is a defensive tackle. He played at Michigan. Um, pretty much the quickest first step I've ever seen a defensive tackle. Uh, he, he's got a really quick first step. He fell down draft boards before last year because of a heart condition, but he played last year. He had four sacks as a defensive tackle. Um, so I see a lot of talent on, on this Oakland roster. Um, so when you look at their six wins and you account for schedule, and this is a calculation I do to figure out what Oakland's rating should be such that they should have six wins. And this means that Oakland's 25th in the NFL. 
And that just seems a little low to me. I mean, you could you could potentially have a top 10 offense. You could have an average defense. Um, so I'm leaning towards the over with Oakland at the six wins. Now, obviously, you can't really make this call until the Antonio Brown situation right. gets resolved. The man has decided that he's not going to play. He might retire because he can't wear the helmet that he wants, uh, which from what I understand is indicative of some of the drama that played out in Pittsburgh last year. He's obviously a talent. Uh, we got to wait a little bit on this one, but I think there's, I think there's some really interesting things going on in Oakland. I mean, it could, you know, would I be shocked if they were the worst team in the league again? No, but I, I, I think, uh, I think their their mean could be very close to the middle of the NFL and not like the lower middle, like everyone's expecting. And one thing that's a positive for Oakland from your perspective is that the over, uh, the juice on the over has changed quite a bit. Uh, they are now plus 165 to go over six and a half wins. And I think that right. a large part of that there derives from the Antonio Brown thing. So right. I think that, you know, we talked about this with whale capper a lot, finding a good time to buy in. If you want to buy in the Raiders, Probably not going to get a whole lot worse than that, I would say. Uh, So that's definitely positive. Also, like, draft picks are valuable. Um, Usually it's in bulk. And, like, you want to have a lot of draft picks. They had nine this year, which is not a super large number. But four of those were in the top 40 selections. They had eight of those in the first five rounds. Seven of them were in the first four rounds. So they got a lot of uh, cracks at guys who were regarded as being very talented players. That is helpful. Colton Miller, their left tackle. He didn't play well last year. He was actually quite bad. Uh, But his combine numbers, once you adjust for his weight, were actually like elite level from an athletic testing perspective. He was just, he's very young. And he's a very raw prospect, but there's the potential he develops into something more. Trent Brown at right tackle played well with San Francisco when he was a right tackle and obviously learned a lot from Dante Scarnecchia last year with the Patriots. Gabe Jackson, their right guard, banged up right now, and I think that that is another reason, along with Antonio Brown, to maybe hold off on them till we get more information on him. But there are reasons to think Oakland could be better than perception. I also think that there is value in betting on laughing stocks because the public perception of Oakland right now is terrible and it's going to put some public money on their unders. So I personally am not going to go out there and seek out an Oakland over bets, but I think that your route, your process in getting there is sound. And I think that there are other reasons to support it as well. Yeah. And, and, and there's some other things that, you know, I mean, they, they were good at throwing the ball last year, but they were terrible at scoring. So that's usually means that they were bad in the red zone and they were one of the, I mean, not the worst in the NFL, but they were, you know, bottom 10 in in terms of red zone efficiency. So those are the type of numbers that can kind of flip from year to year with a little bit of regression. Uh, You know, I mean, I think you have to like the changes in the roster. Yeah. And now it's a question of, you know, can, can Gruden coach it up? Uh, You know, can they get it done on the field? So we shall see. We will certainly find out. I'm talking NFL for mine as well and covering the future. And I'm talking a guy who made his preseason debut last week. And you can't judge a whole lot from preseason because it's oftentimes starters against backups. But Kyler Murray didn't play too poorly. And this is not based on that. But it was just kind of fun to watch Kyler Murray play football once again on a football field. And right now, FanDuel Sportsbook has individual yardage props posted. They went up last week for both quarterbacks and running backs. And... The injury rate at quarterback is lower than at running back, so I think if I'm going to go into one of these markets, I'd prefer to go in at quarterback. And when I'm looking at these markets, I want to find guys we're going to start, and I want to find guys who are stable quarterbacks who project to start the entire year and maintain that role all year, all year long. And Kyler Murray checks both those boxes, and his yardage prop is 3,400 yards with minus 110 on the over, and. I think it makes a lot of sense to go hard at that number because this team, we talked with Bud about, you know, maybe taking advantage of situations that have changed. It doesn't get a whole lot different from what Arizona had last year to go an air raid. And that means that we're going to have heavy passing volume. They should have a fairly positive run pass ratio or, you know, skewed heavily towards the pass. And it also means more snaps because Cliff Kingsbury in college always ran at a super high pace. That is good for yardage, it is good for play volume, and both those things play well when you're trying to bet the over here. 
If we look back to 2019 or 2018, I should say, 3,400 yards passing would have ranked 19th in football. That was right behind Baker Mayfield, who didn't start a couple of, didn't start three games, I believe. And also a run heavy Russell Wilson, right ahead of Cam Newton, Mitchell Trubisky, both of whom missed a couple of games. So it's not a super high number at 3,400 yards. Number Fires projections have Murray at 3,862 passing yards this year. That gives him probably a one or two-ish game cushion to hit the over here, and that is a projection. And I think that that number could honestly sell him a bit short because Kyler Murray was a very talented passer in college. He set the NCAA record for single-season adjusted yards per attempt last year, and we know he's going to start all year long. They're probably going to play from behind, which is not good for efficiency, but it is good for passing volume. And from a pure yardage perspective, which is what we're looking at here, it certainly does not hurt to throw the ball a whole lot. And I would expect Arizona to do exactly that, have a lot of spread formations. And I think that everything bodes well for Kyler Murray to hit the over here at 3,400 yards. I think that among the bets on the board, he is the one I would feel safest making. This is the market that I like best. So I think that Kyler Murray over 3,400 yards is a number I would like to hit uh, while it's still there as of right now. Ed, we don't we haven't really talked about Kyler Murray a whole lot. So uh what is your right. view on him transitioning to the NFL? Well what I wanna ask you, I I mean I'm I'm always a little bit cautious about rookie quarterback, rookie head coach yeah. and, and and all the warnings there. But the thing I want to ask you about Jim is is I don't think you had their offensive line rated that high. Thirty. So yeah, so that's not good yeah. out of thirty two teams. Uh pass protection they were probably bottom five they as were well. Below average, yeah. Below average, at least. So, I mean, does that give you a little bit of pause about uh, Kyler Murray at 3,400 yards? So, I think the one thing that is a positive here, and it's something that Evan Silva, we had on the, the show a couple weeks ago, talked about, uh, has talked about the Cardinals this year, is that at Texas Tech, Cliff Kingsbury did not have offensive line talent. I think they had one offensive lineman drafted in his entire time there. And this air raid system revolves a lot around getting the ball out quickly, trying to utilize, uh, you know, short, short drops. And we did see a lot of that for Murray in the preseason. Now, with that said, the offensive line still managed to allow a lot of pressure. And that was something that just did catch my attention, I would say, uh, that Murray was on the move quite a bit. But I think that I worry about that from, from a fantasy perspective because sacks put you behind the sticks. They lower your touchdown expectation quite a bit. I worry about it a little bit less when it comes to raw passing yardage, just because you're going to have to throw towards the sticks, uh, and that's going to you know increase your ADOT and stuff like that. And Murray was a good deep ball passer. So I think it is a concern for the team as a whole, and it's why I'm not actively betting the Cardinals over this year. And I think that having Kingsbury being the head coach, uh, Patrick Peterson's suspension, those all play into that. But I think with this specific prop, I'm less worried about the offensive line than I am elsewhere. So the offensive line is something that does bother me, and it concerns me with David Johnson a little bit and broadly with this offense. But I think with this specific number, I'm still worried about it, and it does matter. I'm just less worried than I am elsewhere, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I mean, I I do worry that just like if you're a good deep ball thrower, that's great, but you need some time. And uh, is he going to get it? So Right. And but, that is very much a question. Yeah, but, but I will agree with you. I actually talked to John, Josh Hermsmeyer of 538 recently, and he was also very high on, on Arizona's offense. Cool. So like there's it. definitely a consensus amongst the smart data-driven people uh, that this is going to be a pretty good unit. Awesome. Looking forward to that. I think that'll just be fun to watch too, just like from a, right. a football fan perspective. And I'm pretty excited about that. That, that does not relate to betting. But from a selfish perspective, as someone who wants to watch fun football, pretty excited to see what the Cardinals can do this year. That is all we have for today here on Covering the Spread, but more NFL talk later in the week. Keith Goldner of Number Fire, the analytics guru, the guy who runs all of our projections over at Number Fire, going to talk about divisional odds at FanDuel Sportsbook. So make sure you subscribe to Covering the Spread on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, SoundCloud, Stitcher, wherever you get your podcasts, you can find Covering the Spread. Ratings and reviews are huge for us, so If you've enjoyed what you've heard from Bud, from Ed, anybody else, make sure you drop in there and leave us a rating and review, and we so deeply appreciate it from those of you who have done so already. Ed, what you got in store for this week, either on your podcast or over at the Power Rank? 
Yeah, the power rank on my email newsletter, uh, I give a sample of my best computer predictions that I usually save for paying members of the site. Uh, I do that on my email newsletter. There's a little bit of analysis in there as well. And I'm starting a little bit early this year. Uh, the first one will go out Thursday. So if you're interested in that, if you're interested in getting more of uh, some of the analysis that I provide here or analysis like that, you can go to thepowerrank.com and sign up for my free email newsletter. Outstanding. You can find them at thepowerrank.com. You can find Ed on Twitter at thepowerrank. I am at Jim Sanes, J-I-M-S-A-N-N-E-S. You can also follow the FanDuel Podcast Network at FanDuel Podcast. Big thank you goes out to our producer, Calvin Theobald, for chopping things up for the FanDuel Twitter account and keeping us on the air here as well. Big thank you to Bud Elliott for swinging by and spreading his college football knowledge as well. And thank you to all of you for tuning in for today. And we'll talk to you once again on Thursday. This has been covering the spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network. <laughs>